So we've been looking at uh, this theme of the whole Bible, the whole message of the Bible in six words. And it's God loves you, don't be stupid. And we've, we've looked at that in different ways, mostly from the side of God loves you. Because I'm, I'm hesitant to be negative, you know me, <laughs> Mr. Positive. And, uh, but um, today we begin the transition into what happens in us, and what are the implications of God's incredible love for us? And, and I haven't gotten to, don't be stupid, I'm just, I'm just going to get to don't probably today. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you have a Bible with it, turn to 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5. And this is the most worn area of my Bible. This is the area where the pages come out and fold over. So it's very difficult to read, but it's okay. And we're going to start in verse 14. And I love this, this, uh, this first sentence. For Christ's love compels us. Get that? Christ's love compels us. Because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So, from now on, <coughs> we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us how we might be reconciled with you, and we might then be your ambassadors. Grow us, change us, transform us, lead us, heal us. Have your way in us today. That's our prayer. You know, there's a reason those pages are probably uh, the most shredded in my Bible. Um, this is such a central, central, key part of Scripture that uh, brings together this incredible love of God and the implications for our life. And um, a lot of times the focus, uh, you know, as a pastor I'm guilty of this, the, the focus is we're quick to jump to God loves you, and then let's quit talk about our sin, you know, because as a pastor, that's something fun to talk about, you know, especially to talk about your sin, you know, <laughs> leave me out of it. But, um, but actually, the implications of God's love primarily are not focused on our sin. It's focused on what he wants to do in us and through us. And he wants us to, to become alive in Christ and then to live in the grace and the forgiveness uh, and be the new person that he made us to be. A lot of us, you know, for me, you know, I've accepted Christ in my life probably 800 times, most of that before high school, but um, uh, I'm always getting reconverted. But the thing is that um, it's because every time I, I mess up in my life, I think, well, maybe I didn't get it right. So maybe, you know, I'm not really that new creation because look at what a mess I am. Well, those of you who know me really well know, oh yeah, <laughs> he really is a mess. And that's why you come to church, because it makes you feel better about yourself. And I'm glad I can have that ministry for you. But it's really difficult for me to see the new creation that, that God is, is making us to be with, uh, apart from the shadow of the, uh, the sin. That, that is forgiven and uh, that we're set free from. And uh, went back back a long time ago when, when uh, Bobby Reed and I wrote the book um, Getting, uh, Building Strong People, she was at the time, um, she was a 
warden of the California State Penitentiary, mm-hmm. and um, which is a totally different experience, I thought, than being a pastor at a church. <laughs> Found out we had a lot more in common than, you know. But, but one of the things that she shared with me over and over again was that in her life, working in the different uh, uh, penitentiaries in California as a warden, she never met a guilty person. Uh-huh. Ever, any single person she ever met, any inmate, never said they were guilty. It was always, well, this is what happened, or it's a misunderstanding, or I got, you know, blah, 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 or something else. And she said, I have never in my entire life ever met a guilty inmate. And I thought about that, and I thought, well, isn't that strange? You know, that's weird. You know, they're not really aware of their guilt. And then I realized, wait a minute. Isn't that what heaven's supposed to be like? <laughs> isn't heaven supposed to be like a California penitentiary? <laughs> Where you don't meet guilty people. You don't meet, there's, there are no guilty people in heaven. Now, there's a lot of guilty people in this room, maybe, but in heaven, what? We're forgiven. We are new creation, right? And we don't go up to each other and identify each other uh, by our particular uh, sinful preference. <laughs> um, our persuasion. Now, I think about that, and... and uh, that, that kind of came to me this week for the first time, that I may have been doing it all wrong as a pastor all these years, because I've seen a lot of my ministry as helping people get over the uglies, you know? The thing that just kind of has mangled up their life and, and they've sort of defined them. And then I realized, how about this? Do you know that I, true confession, I tend to stereotype people based on what I think their problems are? <laughs> It is so weird. I was thinking about this. That, did any of you do that? You can put your hands up. Are you on the video? You can put your hands up. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so amazing because I started thinking about the way I look at people when I first meet them and I kind of have categories for them. You probably don't do that because you're much better people than me. But I tend to say, oh, look at them. You know, oh, that, that, they're an adulterer. I'm not making any eye contact, okay? <laughs> They're an adulterer, or they're an alcoholic, or they do drugs, or, or they are, are poor, or they uh, are really snotty and rich and snooty and go to the country club, or uh, uh, that's their sin too, you know, and, uh, or anything. They're foreigners. They're something else. And, and as soon as we can get a category for people, we, we know how to handle them. We know where they fit in our life. We know how to relate to them based on what we think their problem is, right? And then the scripture says we no longer, we no longer view people through our worldly point of view. We don't see people in our worldly point of view. So we used to see Christ that way, but we don't do that any longer either. Why is that? It, it means that for me, my worldly point of view is my tendency to figure out what your issue is and then put you in a box because of it. I'll re- relate to you a certain way because I know your issues. And um, that was why maybe confession in the Catholic Church was so powerful because the priests knew everybody's issue. You know, there was a box for everybody. You know, we don't do that so much anymore, but so I just guess. <laughs> but we no longer view people through a worldly point of view. Because if anyone is in Christ, they're the same old person they always were. Nothing ever changes. You might as well forget it. Right? Is that your Bible? Oh, maybe I have the wrong trans. Maybe if anyone is in Christ, oh, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Why is that so hard to, uh, for me to get through my head? Why is it so hard for me to treat people like a new creation? Why is it so hard for me to treat myself like a new creation? You know, I, <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing, but when people ask me who I am, I usually list the bad stuff first. <laughs> and then we're out of time, so I never get to the good stuff. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and so we have this big misunderstanding, and I believe that the, you know, when he says we at once one time we even related to Christ 
to a worldly point of view. We saw him with the same kind of weird glasses, you know, and um, put him into categories. And uh, so uh, Philip Roth, who um, writes uh, <coughs> kind of, uh, you gotta be smart to read his novels, but, um, but he always wins a Pulitzer Prize for him, so they must be important. Anyway, uh, in, in his book, American Pastoral, this is what he says. You fight your superficiality, your shallowness, so as to try to come at people with, without unreal expectations, without an overload of bias or hope or arrogance, um, as untankable as you can be. You come at them unmenacingly on your own ten toes instead of tearing up the turf with your caterpillar treads. You take them on with an open mind as equals, and yet, get this, you never fail to get them wrong. Even with the best intentions, you never fail to get them wrong. You might as well have the brain of a tank. You get them wrong before you meet them, while you're anticipating meeting them. You get them wrong while you're with them. And then you go home to tell somebody else about the meeting and you get them all wrong again. Since the same generally goes for them with you, the whole thing is really a dazzling illusion, empty of all perception, an astonishing farce of misperception. So ill-equipped are we all to envision another's interior workings and invisible aims. We get them wrong. I get you wrong. You get me wrong. We get each other wrong. We get our neighbors wrong. We get the Lord wrong. Even when we're doing our dark, <coughs> just be there and relate. We really want to relate. We have good intentions and we just don't perceive what's really going on. I think that is the essence of what Paul is trying to say here in this letter. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Particularly not Christ. Because we're changed. I think it's time for us to, to look at what it means to be Christ's ambassadors and to be new creations in him and to relate to people through God's eyes. Relate to them from the perspective and the viewpoint and the priorities and everything of God's love rather than our ideas about where they fit into the grid based on their failures. I remember, uh, oh, never mind, I remember we're not getting into the sin stuff yet. That's still the cop. <laughs> don't want don't to rush you there. Um, I've been trying to think, how can we do this? Is it even possible for us to begin to look at people through the eyes of God's love? I don't think it's possible until we allow God's love to penetrate our lives and shape our own uh, view of ourself. And, I, and I'm the first to admit, I really believe in God's love. I believe God loves us, and I'm going to be preaching for a long time with y'all, so better settle back or get on the edge of your seat, either way, um, because I am so convinced of it for you. God really loves you. Now, who's left out of that equation? <laughs> yeah, me. See, I, I said, so, well, you know, yeah, I still got some stuff, you know, before God can really love me. So I find myself... Um, celebrating God's love for you and wrestling on my own side, you know. And I think that's a tendency that many of us have, but I can never be Christ's ambassador in this world as you can't be Christ's ambassador in this world unless you allow God's love to redefine who you are. And we start to see ourselves as this, this new creation in Him. I, this has been an amazing week for me and, uh, you know, uh, the, the book came out Monday and we had, we had a bunch of radio interviews around the country and stuff and uh, I got the nicest email I have received in years 
from someone I've never met in Tennessee who said, believe it or not, I've read all your books and underlined in them. <laughs> <laughs> and this new one, oh, I really love it. And, uh, and then she said this, she said, you're one of my favorite authors right up there with Brennan Manning. Uh -huh. with the ragamuffin <laughs> gospel, yeah. great, great writer. Wow. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. Okay, one of the favorites, I'm not the favorite, you know, but I'm one of them, that's good. <laughs> and so I, so this week I had to go dig out one of Brendan Manning's books to see how I compare, you know. And so, I, and he is really amazing and, and so, so honest. And uh, so I wanted to share something uh, from him. And this is about... <laughs> how we put our thoughts and views in this worldly way, we put them on God. And we start defining God in certain ways, just like we define each other. So he says here, the human tendency towards projection, ascribing to God our thoughts, feelings, and attitudes about ourselves and others, is unmasked in all its absurdity. Distorted images and characters of God as vengeful, whimsical, fickle, and punitive images that cannot fail to engender anxiety, fear, scrupulosity, there's a good word, and unhealthy guilt. All these are exposed for what they are, puny and pathetic human constructs. Then he looks at our tendency to want to make our life right and safe, and he says, the same judgment is passed on the illusion of control. When life is tranquil, relationships intact, finances secure, physical health flourishing, when the enemy is not at the gate, when the war drums are not rattling, when the Calvin Klein perfume advertisement for eternity for men seems plausible, <laughs> then a sense of complacency, self-sufficiency, and personal command of our destiny deludes us and lulls us. There. Even when we think we've got it all together, we're being deluded. We no longer see each other through worldly eyes. We don't see Christ through worldly eyes. We don't see ourselves through worldly eyes. Why? We are a new creation in Christ. And then he goes on to say, and we're his ambassadors. He's committed to us. The message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. Now, I've done some traveling and I've always had sort of a stereotype of ambassadors, right? First of all, they were rich folk or they wouldn't have gotten picked, right? No regular people ever get picked to be ambassadors. I, I, I waited for the call <laughs> through many presidencies, Democrat and Republican, never got called. And they usually are staying away in a pretty cool palatial place with lots of staff around them and pretty aloof from the community that they serve. And then I thought of the church. <laughs> oh my golly, we've been living like ambassadors of the US government in the world, but covered with people around us to sort of buffer things and make sure that we don't actually get involved in the life of the people that were there to serve. How did that happen? It's easy, it's more comfortable. So I've been thinking about this. What does it mean for us to be Christ's ambassadors? If we really did this, right down to it, what, what does it involve? It, it means that we represent the love of Christ, the love of God in Christ to the people around us. Not that we're out there trying to figure out their sin, what they need to confess to get, you know, the Holy Spirit can do that with them. We don't need to remind them. But we do need to remind them of God's amazing love in Christ. And that can be expressed in subtle ways, in quiet ways, in clear ways, uh, but it can only be expressed basically one-on-one. -on -one. Now, uh, I, I've experienced a lot of really bad witnessing 
for Christ. You know, a lot of really poor evangelism in my day. I've done a lot of really bad evangelism in my day. Highly ineffective, but I felt good about it at the time. But, um, I mean, I remember, we were a young married couple. I, the week before I started seminary in Pasadena, we moved in our new apartment. We had friends over for dinner. And the week before, we had attended a young couples class at Glendale Presbyterian Church. We were kind of excited, wanted to start going to that church. And until there was a knock on the door, and two guys in dark suits, no kidding, dark suits, how stereotypical is that, showed up at the door and said, we're from Glendale Press, and we noticed you visited Sunday, and so we'd like to come in and, and share with you about some things. And I said, well, that's great. You know, we really enjoyed it, and we'll probably be back, but we've got company now, and we're sitting down to dinner, so, you know, not a good time. Started to close the door. No, they wouldn't go away. They had closure skills. They were going to get in and share with me because they'd gone through the tra training for the evangelism explosion uh, in which you ask certain questions. If they give you the wrong answer, then you have to give them the right answer and all those things, you know, and they were so trained and ready to go and they had my address. So they were getting in the house. So I said, well, you know, it's okay because, you know, my wife and I, we're Christians and actually the people we're having dinner with are also Christians. And, and I'm starting seminary next week. I'm going to be a pastor in the Presbyterian Church, you know, just like Lindell Press, you know. Like maybe I'll be your pastor. So it's all right. You, don't, you can go talk to somebody else who needs it. No. They were coming in, sitting down and asking me, would you die and go to heaven? And then St. Peter asked you why you got in. What is your answer? I wanted to say because I didn't kill you on the spot. <laughs> Uh, maybe I did say that. <laughs> anyway, they left in a huff. Um, but I thought, okay, was that being an ambassador for Christ? Oh, no. No. That's being Gestapo for Jesus. That's you know, different. That's a little different, you know. And so, uh, but, so then I thought, well, what does it mean for us to be ambassadors? It means that we come alongside. It's usually going to involve getting to know somebody because we don't usually know them and we don't want to project who we think they are on them first and we start to share we start to talk and then pretty soon in this relationship we begin to love them like God loves them and maybe for the first time they're experiencing somebody who's loving them and not wanting something from them doesn't have a plan for them something to extract right so I've been thinking about this if we did, when, when I first was uh, uh, asked to come and plant a harbor church, living up in Edmonds, we had nothing, you know, you, some of you were there, you know, meeting in the home, and then I had to figure out what a life was like during the week until the next home meeting with eight people, and uh, pretend to be a pastor. And so uh, somebody told me, what you need to do is have three meaningful conversations a day. <laughs> Doesn't matter where they are, who they're with, you have to have three meaningful conversations a day. And so I did, and sometimes that was all I had. It was like you go, you try and find somebody to have coffee with to talk, and so you don't feel like you're a worthless slug. And um, so I'm, I'm thinking about that. Thought, Wait a minute, what if we had three meaningful conversations a day, right, with people, which we just represented the love of Christ to? Okay. I started doing the math. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a math person, anybody who knows me. So if any of you have, you know, your iPhones and you want to check me of the calculator program <laughs> app, um, you can do that. Hang on. <laughs> you have to push it, you can't turn it. Okay. So I didn't know. Okay. So, okay, so you have these three conversations a day, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
trying to get through the slide roll. Yeah. <laughs> hey, okay, so in the 20 weeks, it, there, uh, there's 52 weeks in a year, I'll help you with that. <laughs> people in Calgary are going, Seattle people know nothing. You know? <laughs> so, uh, they're, they're, yeah, they say it's 52 weeks a year, but again, you're going to be on vacation for a couple of weeks, you don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> I, I know how you are, so let's just make it 50, uh, 50 weeks, so that would be okay, so 50 uh, weeks in a, in a, I'm sorry, in a year, okay, good, so that equals how many? A thousand conversations, in, encounters, <laughs> where we just demonstrate Christ's incredible love. We represent Christ's love to people, okay? Without trying to figure out their particular sin, okay? We're just going to represent Christ's love to them. A thousand in a year. Okay, now I'm thinking, so there's like, I don't know, 50 or 60 people worshiping here, and so we go, if we took 50 people, because some are working with Sunday school, so they don't really count, you know. But, but if we took 50, what would that be? 50, 50 people, and you have thousands, so that would be 50,000. See, now you see why I wasn't good in the counting. <laughs> Thing. I'm the books here. <laughs> okay, so we have 50,000, we would have 50,000 encounters or demonstrating the, the love of Christ, this incredible love of Christ that compels us and treat people like they're new creations in a year. Then I thought, wait a minute, we're not short timers here. We're like the people in the, you know, California penitentiary. So, what would happen in five years if we did this? What would that be? 250,000 encounters in which we are Christ's ambassadors to people. Just the folks here, right here in this room right now. Isn't that amazing? That's shocking to me. I was stunned. But then I thought, well, you know, really, Nobody comes every week here. We, all, we have a different crowd, you know, each week people are flanking, they, they can stay away for a couple of weeks and then they come and stuff. So really, we've got about 100 people. So that would make this 500,000 opportunities to represent Christ's love with the people around us. Oh my golly. That's more than all the people in Crown Hill, Ballard, Shoreline, Edmonds, uh, keep going around with the bay, you know, uh, uh, Bellevue. <laughs> That's a lot of people. And just over the next few years, if we just do what the scripture says, without trying to figure out what sin they've got to deal with first, just representing Christ's love. All of a sudden, I thought, this is shockingly profound and shockingly doable. Mm -hmm. This isn't like you have to be out every minute hunting down people. This is three conversations with the waitress at the restaurant, with the greeter at Target, uh, with the person who supervises you from HR, who you're trying to impress. It doesn't matter really who. Right? It's represent Christ's love to them. Because anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away, and look, all things are new. We've got to live in that. Not just believe it, we've got to live in that. 